So the first thing we see is that Jesus rises up early and he goes into prayer. Right? What he's doing is, is Jesus, first thing in the morning, he has decided that he is going to worship. Right? It did not matter that it was a long night prior to. The next day was going to be prioritized with worship. As you can see, the, in the previous section, the, the night had gotten late as he was healing and casting out demons, but now we see Jesus getting up while it's still dark. First thing, worshiping the Lord in prayer. Now, I didn't used to be a morning person. Um, I used to, before children, BC, right? I used to stay up uh, all evening. The kids seem, seem to change that. And now, now I truly, I love the morning, and there is, for me, a great benefit of waking up before everyone else wakes up so that I can prioritize a uh, time where I can pray and where I can read Scripture, where I can just be silent as I go to the Lord. Again, that's what we see in verse 35. It says, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Right? Jesus had plenty to do, yet he sought to pray. I would argue if God incarnate thought it was important to have a devotion time, we should as well. Right, think about it, if anybody could get away without praying, that person was Jesus. But he prioritized prayer. If he, of all people, didn't neglect prayer, who among us should be neglecting this? I think one of the most troubling things about the church currently is how many people have, have openly confessed to me and to Will that worship has ceased that prayer has ceased, that reading scripture has ceased, never mind the corporate gathering, just family worship in general has just come to an end. Listen, I I don't believe that worship is put on the back burner because of COVID or because of weird political times. I think it has much more to do with priority. Priority. Notice the first thing that Christ does. By the way, this would have been on a Sunday morning after the Jewish Sabbath, which was on Saturday. That next morning, right after corporate worship, Jesus doesn't start the week as if the previous day didn't happen, right? What does he do? He's off worshiping, first thing. He's not waiting for a week to go by before he prays again, before he goes to his Father. Oftentimes, I think, often in mind that we believe the church's primary purpose is to do good works or to be missional. And though these are good things, truth is, the primary function of the church is to worship. Right? And prayer is simply a manifestation of that. It's not a thing to do, but it's an act of worship where we speak to God in both thanksgiving or frustration. But what it's become is prayer is this neglected cornerstone of Christian worship. I love what Jonathan Edwards, I believe it was him, who said, For the Christian, prayer should be as natural and as unceasing as breathing. I don't, I don't know if you've all ever watched the, a TV show called Monk. I love it, truly for a variety of reasons. Um, but Monk is this detective who, whose wife was, who was murdered and and now he uh, is, has this debilitating OCD and, and social anxiety. And uh, he is a miserable person. Uh, he's been miserable for the, in the show for eight to ten years, roughly. And there's this one episode where uh, he has to go undercover. And he has to act normal. And part of the normal human experience is, is laughter. And he can't do it. He's so miserable that he tries to laugh, and it's as if he has forgotten how to do it. He's neglected the idea of laughing for so long and has ceased to be joyful that he is unable to be happy. He's unable to laugh, and it's uncomfortable and unnatural for him to do so, and it's uncomfortable for everyone to watch. And like this, I think in the church, somehow 
Prayer has ceased to be the unceasing act of worship that we're called to participate in. Somehow it's devolved into some sort of art form in which we observe, but we are not actively engaged. I think it's as if we've forgotten for many of us on how to speak to our God. And so Jesus shows us the right priority, right? Before he is around anybody, before he puts himself in corporate worship, he is going to be a part of a private worship. Listen, if our private worship is unhealthy, our corporate worship will follow. If our private worship is spotty and flaky, corporate worship will follow. Luther, Martin Luther, had a really interesting take on worship. He talks about how when he was busy, the, the busier the time or the day that he had, when he looked at the schedule and he saw how full it was, he would devote more time to prayer. That's deeply convicting for me. And I know that seems counterintuitive, right? Because, right, I, with our faulty, pragmatic view of Christianity, we think, what on earth am I accomplishing by devoting more time to prayer? Rather than understanding that before we enter into anything, we need to align our hearts and minds. We need to reflect on His nature. We need to remember the grace and mercy that we're under. And we need to ask for wisdom and discernment. We need to renourish our soul before that day's battle. Verse 36 says, And Simon, by the way, who's Peter, and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him, and they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. Right? Peter says, Everyone is looking for you. Again, you can't read too much into tone, but it makes you wonder if this, it feels almost like this is a soft rebuke of Jesus for leaving. Like, Jesus, what are you doing? There's a bunch of people who came and who are waiting for you. We've got ministry to do. You don't have the time to sit here and pray. In fact, isn't this what we've been praying for? A bunch of people to come to our door and you left. Peter has his priorities a bit out of order. We see everyone was looking for Jesus. Isn't that a good thing? Everyone looking for Christ? If it were said in Taze Valley or in Milton that everyone was looking for Jesus, would we not be glad? It all depends on the motivation, doesn't it? Anytime that I have to leave town, I come home, and I know that my kids are going to be happy to see me. I have a close relationship with them. But there's no doubt that when they're happy to see me, right, I am curious of their motivation. I'm thinking, are you happy to see me or are you happy to see what I brought home to you? I think that's what we see here. Right? It seems people want to see Jesus for what he can bring them. Some sort of physical comfort. So Jesus, after personal devotion makes it known his mission is to proclaim the gospel. And that's what we see, right? We see that Jesus' mission was not to heal all the sick. He could have done it if he wanted to, but he chose otherwise. And we see big crowds coming to Jesus. Jesus usually leaves, and that's not because he has my social anxiety. He doesn't have my dislike for loud noises. He just decides he's leaving, which, again, seems confusing. Here, you have all these people who've come to see Jesus, and Jesus says, I'm going to the next town. Peter's go, all these people have come to see you. And Jesus' response is, well, I want to go the other direction. It's because it was never about the miracle. Right? It's always been about the message. And if you come to Jesus for what he can offer, where's your faith when little is offered? When what you're left with is difficulty. Mission culture in churches are sometimes not always bad. Of course, mission is, is good. We ought to be missional. 
But when mission culture and churches, when that's primary, what you're reduced to is mere humanitarianism. The mission isn't get people the gospel. It becomes more about benevolence. It becomes more about the poverty. It becomes more political. Listen, our mission is wholeheartedly about proclamation of Christ Jesus and his work. Listen to what verse 38 says. says, He said to them, let us go on to the next town that I may preach there also, for this is why I came out. Again, Peter says, hey, we got a bunch of people who want to see you. And Jesus responds with, yeah, I want to move on. To proclaim God's good news is like a fire in Jesus' bones. And this had to be puzzling for Peter. Had to be. Why would you want to go the other way? We have crowds of people right here. Again, the mission was not to heal. It was to preach repentance and their need for grace. Church, I'm going to remind you that's your mission today. Right, the church is not, uh, the mission of the church is not to develop new church programs. The mission of the church is not for me to preach political sermons. The mission of the church is to preach Christ crucified. We see verse 39, it says, And he went throughout all Galilee preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. I love this, right? The gates of hell are knocked down by the faithful preaching of the gospel. And what we see is all through this section is worship is greater than mission, and mission is greater than works. And it's done in that order. Hopefully our works fuel the mission, which is to get more people to worship. Our soul focus, when, when your alignment of these things is out of whack, what we see is a soul focus on mission makes it more about soul winning than it is about God's glory, which leads us to some unhealthy fundamentalism or legalism. A soul focus on works makes it about love and humanitarianism more than God's glory. We see it devolve into universalism and some sort of theological liberalism. A focus on worship, which is God's glory, is the right priority for us and it appropriately propels us into mission and unto works. So after we see that Jesus started off in worship and then he shows what his mission is, it is now that Christ is going to work. In verse 40, he says, And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. This is an act of extreme desperation. Right, to approach someone this closely as a leper. Josephus, this ancient Jewish historian, wrote, uh, was, wrote about this, and it's interesting to see what the Jewish culture thought about those with leprosy. The way he defined it is that no, they were no way differing from a corpse. Right? They were this walking dead, in other words. They were dead already. They're just waiting on death to arrive. It's interesting. We preached on leprosy back when we went through Leviticus. And the Lord kind of used it as a uh, quarantine, as an interesting prop. Leviticus uh, in, in chapter 13 is the week we began quarantine church uh, through that and through the six books of Daniel, uh, or the first six in Daniel. And it was, it was interesting, right, what we saw in Leviticus, what God believes and says about uh, leprosy. Now, the reason I want to point this out to you is because I want you to see what the Jewish people in Jesus would have thought about Someone with leprosy. Verse 45 and 46. The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. And he shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean and he shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Talk about social distance. Having to yell to everyone, unclean, unclean. We see Mark 1, 41 through 42. Now that you have a visual, by the way, of who is coming up to Christ. 
says that Jesus was moved with pity. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Right, people avoided lepers because of the fear of it spreading. That's something we can relate to. Not long ago, I was um, in the post office, and there was this line, uh, <laughs> a line out of the post office behind me, and, and a bunch of people in front of me, and everyone was, you know, spread out six feet. But I was in that weird place kind of where the opening of the post office is, right? This is the glass opening where you're kind of stuck. And... Um, here I was, and I had my face mask on like I'm supposed to, and I had a drink, and I'm trying to drink under the mask, trying to get the straw to fit under the mask, and I'm sitting there drinking, and, and the drink went down the wrong uh, pipe. And the next thing you know it, I'm, I'm coughing uh, incredibly, incredibly hard, and I, I, and I notice people begin to be kind of concerned about, about the noises I'm making and the, the, the harness in which I'm coughing. And, and that six feet began to spread out. People got a little bit further away as they looked at me. Um, and I tried to ease them by saying, squeezing out in between the little breath that I could get, it's not corona, but that didn't seem to ease anybody or make anyone feel more comfortable at all. And in that moment, right, it's, it's like I felt like a, like a leper. No one wanted to be around me. They wanted their distance. But we see, in this moment with this leper, no one else wanted to be around, but Jesus comes and he touches the untouchable. He touches the untouchable. Reminding everyone that there's nothing too big or too gross or for your Savior. You see, for, for them, the leprosy was a product of this man's sin. That's what they would have believed. That somehow this man was in so much sin that, that God had cursed him with a skin disease. But Jesus wasn't afraid of coming in contact with the unclean. Because Christ himself is holy. One of my favorite parts, in fact, speaking of Leviticus a minute ago, one of my favorite parts of Leviticus is in the Holy of Holies. When something unholy touched that which was holy, the unholy became holy. Right? Showing you this, this idea that when the holy... One comes, and as we see here, touches the leper. The leper is made clean, foreshadowing beautifully what happens to those who are covered in the blood of Christ. The man that no one wanted to be around, Jesus came to him. Right, This person was as good as dead, but Christ healed him. If you look, look at 43 through 44, it says, and, and Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. Now this is strange and a bit intriguing to me, why Jesus does this. Right? But he heals them and he says, listen, don't, don't say anything to anyone and go do the law of Moses. To perform that ceremonial cleansing. But I think, why does Jesus do this? Should we not want to tell others about Christ? The only thing, and I think we see this in the coming verses, Jesus didn't want another mob of people only seeking physical health and well-being. Remember, that's what we have in this case. We have flocks of people, crowds of people following Christ, not because they're concerned of him being the Savior, but because they simply want something from him, some sort of comfort. Also, I think it's noteworthy, the filth that is in one person does not adhere to others, nor does, it, does externally in cleanliness defile the clean of heart. So he touches him and this man's untouchability, that he might instruct us in humility, that Jesus may teach us that we should despise no one or abhor no one because of some wound or blemish for which they suffer. And this man, once cleansed by the Lord, is no longer a leper. The man is made new. 
And in his newness, by the way, being saved from death, he's not only made new for, uh, in the sense of his society, he now can be with his friends and family, he can be reintroduced into culture where before he had to live in desolate places, now he can be with people. But there's something that could easily be overlooked here. He's not just restored to society, but he's restored to worship. Notice what does Christ tell this man? He doesn't say, listen, go tell everyone why I've come. In fact, he tells them the opposite. He doesn't say, hey, now that I've done something nice for you, you go do something nice for everybody else. Rather, he sends him to the temple to worship. This would have been remarkable for this man. He never would have been able to worship before in the temple because he had leprosy. Those were leprosy were not permitted there. So, this man, so Jesus restores this man and to both community, but restores him so that he may worship. What I love is how Jesus was moved with compassion. His mission had not changed. We are to help people along the way with our mission, no doubt, but our mission isn't physical help. Jesus' mission, uh, mission was not physical help. It was eternal help. And that's what we see. In verse 45, he continues, says, but he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. So unless they were made clean, as I mentioned, the leper's dwelling place had to be in a desolate place. It could not be around people. Again, ironically, this man is allowed to be with family and friends. He's allowed to worship, be in the temple. But what do we see happen to Jesus? He's now driven to desolate places. In this interesting story that Mark tells, what is connected to the work of Christ, we see a substitution. A leper is made clean and brought back from desolation. But Christ, who made him clean, is now driven to desolate places. This beautifully foreshadows the great substitution that's going to happen. Where Christ would take our burdens and our sins and nail them to a cross. So here's the moral of the story. We see that Jesus had compassion on us. And it's shown us grace. We see the work of Christ, right? The life, the death on the cross and his resurrection, those are his works. A move by our God that cannot be described in words or in song adequately. But where the Son, the second person of the Trinity, would go in our place, that we may dwell with Him. Right? We are the leper who benefits from the work of Christ, who've been made clean, who are brought into biblical community, and who are permitted to worship. But Jesus also, before that, He's revealed Himself to us the mission. Right? It was his mission to reveal himself through his works that he had predetermined before the foundations of the earth. The mission was set in the beginning. It was always, plan A was always for Christ to come and die. His mission, we see, was to teach. The works was to get their attention. But the end, the goal, right, the end goal was worship. We begin with worship. We end with worship. Even with the man, right? Even with the leper. Who's healed and, and what does he do immediately after being confronted with the work of Jesus? He goes and he worships. Imagine if we prioritize these things in the wrong order. I want to tell you what it looks like. If the mission drives the worship, then when the mission gets difficult, worship becomes harder. 
I've seen and I experienced this very thing where worship dries up because the mission ground is not as fertile as it once was. Pastors struggle with this all the time. I think we all do. If works drives the worship, then when the work seems ineffective, right, worship becomes stale. Right, it, it's not enough. It becomes centered around serving man and being left in all of God. I want you to ask yourself, how was it that Paul could worship in prison? Surely his works were limited. The mission was difficult. But how was he able to worship? I think of Jeremiah, who his entire life, he had four converts, his entire life. Right? If Jeremiah were a church planner, he'd have a church of four. But yet he's able to worship. The mission is hard. The work seems ineffective. They're able to do this because mission and works was not their fuel. I've talked to people, just to be transparent with you, who are discouraged and find it difficult to worship in settings like this and times like this. How do I worship when only few people come without the full band? There's no doubt mission and works becomes far more difficult in a pandemic. Listen to me carefully. We ought to be able to worship in both the highs and the lows. Whether that's with 160 or whether that's in isolation as we see Christ in the beginning. My hope is what drives us, what drives us to worship is the nature and the character of God, who He is. Any way other than that, and it becomes worship becomes dependent on what God's doing for us in the moment. That's not why we worship. It was the mission and the work of Jesus Christ that allows us to worship Him. And we see His nature and His character through His work and mission. It allows us to continue in our mission and it, continue, it allows us to continue in our work when we worship Him properly for who He is. It allows us to produce good works when we do so for His glory and out of a love for him. Church, I ask that we go to our Lord and we ask him that we are kept from misplaced priorities.